Ed Hargreaves, welcome into the uh, HR studio. My ambushed, you ambushed me earlier. You ambushed me. I think it was your way around. It wasn't. Well, I said to you, you need to get in, in the studio. And then and then the next thing I had was, I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 I was like, shit. I had to get my admin square anyway. Very good to see you. I think last time, well, apart from when we, I, I drove past you randomly three years ago down the road, uh, was... Um, God, it would have been when, when you were still in 3 Power that I saw you. When, when did you leave 3 Power? Yeah, that was a, a few years ago, wasn't it? 2005, Jesus. I left 3 Power. <coughs> Jesus Christ. Ages ago. Ages ago. There is one, there is one uh, distinct memory in my mind of you. And uh, when you first came to... This when you first came to A Company 3 Power. And I... Uh, this story won't resonate with many people because not many people are A Company 3 Power and m- most people are Power Edge anyway. Listen to this, all different people from all different backgrounds. But it was when you took us on a run somewhere because you're the PTI, obviously. You took, us, took the company on a run somewhere and uh, and uh, Coatsy shat himself. Remember? <laughs> Remember this? He took us on a run. Everyone did the run. And he, <laughs> shit, he shat himself on the way around the run and you pulled him out and used him as an example of... Um, look how hard this man has tried. He's tried so hard, he shot himself. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried where this story was going to go, but I do remember that. <laughs> yeah, so, mate, funny. He, he popped up, a picture of him popped up yesterday on uh, I might have been Instagram. And that that, that uh, memory immediately popped into my head. And I think the fact that he uh, he, he he soiled himself was nothing to do with how hard he tried in the run. It was more to do with a dodgy <laughs> meal the day before, I think. Anyway, anyway, that's that's that's, an, that's the first memory. Brilliant. Mate, good good to have you in. February you left. February you left the military. You, how many months ago was that? Flipping heck. Se- eight month mm, eight months ago. Power Edge Master. Yeah. No, six months. Seven months ago. Nine months. Eight months ago. <laughs> Let's call it eight. It's October, isn't it? Yeah. Eight months ago, um, you are well into the shock. The shock phase of oh my god I'm out and to top it off, you've you've got your own, you haven't aligned yourself your own business, mate. Have you decided you want to get back in yet? Um no, I'm a, like you say it's a, I, I describe it, I've described it before. It's a bit like jumping out of a plane. <coughs> so it's scary when you're at that door for the first time, but then when you're out. There's nothing you can do about it. And all you've got to worry about then is the landing. And um, and I've landed and uh, and I've got no broken bones as yet. So <laughs> I, it's all going well. I'm not going to lie. I'm not making millions. Not yet. Um, but that was never the plan. Um, this, this was probably a five-year plan in the making in my mind. Um, so I was happy what I was going to do. But... Um, Obviously, things change as well. So you've got to be... Uh, I've been quite pragmatic with the approach and change a few things along the way. And things are still going to change. Well, what have you, had, what have you learned since you left? What's about business... About, well, about anything about business, about Civvy Street? Because I remember when I left, the first few months, in fact, the first few days, I was like, oh, my God. Why did, why did no one tell me about this before I left? Or that? Or this? Or this is so different to all I thought. It's it's like a whirlwind of new experiences, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive learning curve, isn't it? Uh, I, I'm quietly confident with the actual delivery. That's what I've done. I'm a fitness instructor. I've got lots of experience. I'm happy with that. The business side, that's the scary bit. That's the bit, that, like you say, no one tells you. So it's a case of learning as you go along. Um, and I'm sure there's... I could have done things slightly better, but but and there'll probably be times I look back and go, yeah, I should have done X, Y, and Z. But I think it's a journey, and um, I'm trying to enjoy the journey and, and and learn as I go along. And um, and so far, so good. I've met some good people. Um, I've got some great clients. Um, and the funny thing is, it, you, you take like the military is great, isn't it? Because you get looked after. You've got your meals, you've got your accommodation, you don't have to worry about where the next paycheck's coming from. And you, you haven't got that. As soon as you leave, your security blanket's gone. And um you've got to you've got to work hard for it. I believe there's there's opportunity there's, there's a lot of opportunity out there, but you, you can't just sit and wait for it to happen. You've got to go out and look for it and and um 
yeah, and, and grab things when when they happen. It's like you invited me today. Yeah, that's like let's do it. Uh, I, I thank you for inviting me along. I've never done a podcast before, but I didn't know what to expect. But hey, here I am, and it's just it's it's one of those. You just let's go for it. What what's the worst that can happen? Um, again, it's like anything. You, I've, I've, I've got confidence in my ability, but it's how do I get my message across? And I'm not a massive company where I can throw loads of money at advertising. So for me at the moment, it's word of mouth. I'm, I'm, I, I'm building gradually um, through people coming along. Um, I give them a good experience, train them in the best way I, I, I know possible. Um, and then they then tell their friends and family. And, and at the moment, that's how it's kind of working. Um, and it's working well. And off the back of that, I started off thinking, right, yeah, fitness, um, outdoor fitness, um, not absolutely not a boot camp. Um, it's one thing, oh yeah, you're a boot camp. No, I'm not, I'm not a boot camp. Um, I don't want to be a boot camp. Um, I'm an outdoor fitness provider, but I take people out into the countryside, away from parks, away from the hustle and bustle. Um, there's some beautiful countryside around, around this area around Warwickshire. So it's about getting people out there so it's good for their mental health and their mental well-being at the same time. So we go on a journey. People come on a journey and on that journey <coughs> we train and we train in different ways um, and we, we change it up so it isn't the same old journey, isn't the same old exercises. We mix it up each time people... But when you're on. saying journey, right, you're not on about life journey, you're on about that is one of your sessions and you literally go from point A to point B or maybe point A to point D with B, C in the middle. That's what you're talking about when you're saying journey, right? Yeah, sorry. No. Exactly what I mean. So you turn up and, again, you, it's not about abilities. I, I take different abilities. Depending on your ability, depends on how much weight you're going to carry. So if you're Mr. Super, super Fit or M Mrs. Super Fit, you're going to probably carry a bit more weight. And if you're not so fit or you haven't trained for a while, you're going to carry um, a, a lot less weight. But all the Bergen's rucksacks, they all look the same. So... It takes away that sort of that feeling of, oh, I'm only carrying a little pack. Your your, your pack looks the same, and then we go out and the journey will, within a, the average session of an hour, um, we'll probably cover three to four kilometres depending. But then on the way round, we'll stop off and do different types of exercises. Um, we'll do some M on sessions. We'll do some boxer size. We'll do some Tabata. Um, you name it, we do it. Resistance training, TRX. Um, using what's around us so we use the rucksacks we use the trx's we use each other um you don't need you don't always need lots of expensive gym equipment and um, it's just nice to refreshing to be outdoors using the environment so again we train whatever the weather uh, obviously if there's a lightning strike i'll probably um postpone that session but the, the weather's part of it, it it's um, but at the same time i'm we don't get people crawling around in mud i'm not trying to get people to be soldiers this is purely about getting people fit um, physically and mentally. Um, did you start? Did you start the business while you were still serving? Did you do that? Yeah. So I used my um, what do they call it now? Your resettlement. So e Elkas. Those. Yeah. Oh, your resettlement. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so th th everyone that listening who's ex services or in the services, you know, you get your resettlement and um, your grants and all these courses get thrown at you. You can go and do a plumber's course, builder's course. Um, for me, I I looked at, well, actually, I don't want those courses. What I need is time. I need time to set up a business. So I was fortunate enough to have a, a very good um, commanding officer. And um, and I just asked the question. I said, look, I, I don't want to do the courses. Uh, the other thing that, the other problem was that when I was supposed to be doing my, my resettlement was when we had the pandemic. So most of these courses weren't being weren't on anyway. Um, or they're online. So I used the opportunity to start my business um, using my resettlement time, um, and which has actually worked out very well, which gave me a little bit of a, an opportunity um, to get it going off, off the ground. I do, think, I do think that the best time to start a business is when you've got a supplemental income um, and when you've got time to be able to do it. But so like you did there, you know, you know, and there's other people I know who set up businesses while they were serving, and then they've, and then in, with the important part is they've made then a break clean and imp uh, uh, there's been a point where they've gone right, I need to, this needs now my all of my attention to make it fly, 
as opposed to just trying to go on and, and sort of eat, eat, have your cake and eat it, getting your military income or whatever supplementary income you got, and the 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 um your, the your your new business. A prime example is you know Sinita's Guild. Sinita's Guild was started when when he was still serving. Contact Coffee. There was people behind that still serving that started. Development Society. People people uh, still serving when they started that. Um, and, a, and a whole host of others, but in my experience and where I've been part of businesses in the past and they failed, I've been part of fucking loads of businesses and they failed, some that I you know, I started myself and others that other people started is because I didn't commit 100% to it. There needs to be a time where you, you, you have to put all your... And it, it's risk involved. There's risk. Because <clears throat> to put all your time, 100% of your time into something like that to make it happen. And this doesn't just apply to businesses, right? It applies to personal development, getting fit, losing the weight, you know, you gotta you gotta fully commit to it, and sacrifice other stuff in order to achieve that goal. If you think it's important enough, then sacrifice other stuff to do it. And I I never did that, um, and uh, and so those those things failed. They didn't go anywhere. Or you could argue was their success in some way, shape, or form. Like they didn't go bankrupt or none of that. But they had to stop because it was just pointless. The the the, like the sort of the effort that was going into it was we just didn't make it. It wasn't worth. It was just sustaining it. it. wasn't any growth there. It wasn't sort of turning over any decent money or any, or any money whatsoever. So yeah, you've got you've got to put the time in. Um, but a little bit different with the military, like you say, sometimes you get an opportunity to maybe put nearly a hundred percent of the time in, and have the, and you do get to have your cake and eat it for a short period, you know. Yeah. So you know, are you doing Warrior Strong now, flat out, hundred percent all the time? Yeah. This so now, hundred percent of my time is is going into this. Um, and like you say, yeah, I was given the, I had the opportunity, and I think sometimes when you get the opportunity, you've got to take it. Um, it's still early days, still early days, and um, I hope that it, it, it's going in the right direction. Um, like I say, I'm, it isn't a case of, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm earning thousands and thousands, um, but that wasn't the main reason I wanted to start this. It sounds slightly strange. I, obviously, I need to make any business needs to make money. Um, but for me, it was more of a, the reason I wanted to do it, um, rather than stay in the military, like I was offered the opportunity to put my papers in and, and, and try and try for, com- for a commission. But um, I'd served 23 years, and I just got to the point where I thought, you know what, I want to try something else in my life. Um, and if I if I wait around another 10 years, I'd probably be, I wouldn't probably have the energy levels that I've still got. And so... And in the military, it is, it's, almost, it's almost like the safe option. And I thought, I want to try and do something on my own and make my own decisions. And if I made the, if the wrong decisions, I can only blame myself. Um, but I can make those decisions. And that, that's kind of drove me to, to leave and start my business. At the same time, I feel like I've got things to offer. I've learned so much uh, through the military um, like I said, I'm not an academic. I'm, I, I've got no. I didn't go to university. I, I don't think I even ended up with any GCSEs. But I've learned through experience, and all that experience through serving in in uh, three power, and since then s- serving in the Royal Army Physical Training Corps, and as an adventure training instructor, and climbing some of the biggest mountains, paddling some of the biggest rivers. All that experience, I've gone. You know what? I've got stuff to offer, things I can show and help and advise and educate and provide out into the civilian world. And um, there's loads of transferability of skills from the military life to the civilian life. And it's just being able to move the show how they can be transferred across. And I get the satisfaction from seeing, uh, from taking people out, whether it's through fitness or for their helping them mentally or even... I'm, I've been running some team building activities for business and um, and helping people with their business with team building and leadership training and and other things such as that. So, um, yeah, so it's the, the satisfaction of uh, doing something for yourself but also helping others. Um, and the, the, the money side of it is is almost like a secondary to me. I do need it. Obviously, I need to pay the mortgage. Um, but it isn't the main reason I've gone into business. Um, the main reason was to to prove to myself that I could create something from nothing 
um, and to bring out the experiences and, 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 and move those over. What do clients sound like? What, what, what kind of reasons do they come to you? Good question. The, I've got a mixed, mixed bag, absolute mixed bag. I've got, like some of my clients are, are serving parachute regiment soldiers. So they come back off leave and they come and do training sessions with me. Um, either to maintain their fitness while they're on leave um, or because they want to maybe go further in their careers and do different things and they know they need to just increase their fitness. And I suppose they're gaining from me not just the fitness side, it's the mental part of it as well. So they, I don't just offer a fitness session, I offer them, we talk, conversation like we're having now we're, we're, and you learn and you develop and you, you get an understanding and they ask questions and I... And so I've got guys like that. I've got, at the other end of the spectrum, I've got ladies into their 60s that come training with me. Um, and sometimes I'll train together. <coughs> and some people are, well, how can you have like an 18, 19 year old power trooper train with a 65 year old lady? Like different ends of the spectrum when it comes to fitness abilities. But because they carry different weight, they, they can still do the same session. They might do less or more reps accordingly. But the good thing is the it kind of brings people together. It builds community. It build, it, and it works really, really well because the, the people that are fitter, they almost get the kudos from the others because, oh, wow, look, you're carrying four, how much weight are you carrying? You've got round. And so they're getting that bit of kudos. And everyone likes a bit of kudos, don't they? But, the, but then the, the people who aren't as fit, they... How often do you get the opportunity to train with fit people? Normally, you get put in a ability group. So, right, you're fit. Right, the fit people go off and train that way. The people that aren't so fit will go off and train over there. So, you never get to train with fit people. So, the idea of my warrior sessions is we all train together. We go out together. We come back together. We, n we never leave anyone behind. We tab out together. We wait for people. We go over style. We wait until the last person's in before we move off. We always work together. And... So then that also encourages those people that may be not as motivated to go to train alongside some really some of the fittest people that we have. It's good for them and, th and they love it. And I'm, I'm creating now, I'm starting to create sort of, sounds a bit of a cliche, but almost like a tribe. I call it the warrior tribe. Um, and it, it's bringing people together from the local area and and people are really buying into it and there's friendship groups forming and, and that type of thing and hopefully we're going to have some socials and we're going to have some more events as well. We did an event um, a couple of months ago and um, it was called the Warrior Strong Fitness Dance Party which I put a little video out there the other day and um, just to showcase what I do um, it, but it, <laughs> to be honest it was completely at the wrong time of my life to organise an event in the, within the same week as my wife was giving birth to our second child. <laughs> so I put myself under a little bit of stress and pressure, but it worked and everyone thoroughly enjoyed it and, and said it was really good when you're doing the next one. And um, so it spurred me on now. I'm like, right, we need to get another event going. And um, some of them are going to be big, some are going to be small. So we're going to do a, a night tab. So the idea is we're going we're gonna to probably meet at a, a pub just do me a favor, pull that mic down slightly. You are fucking booming through. But you pull. There you go. Now talk. Is that better? Yeah, we're back up. Then, we're going to um, we're going to start a, a pub, and we're going to head off at night, and we're going to go for. I haven't decided yet what it's going to be, but it's going to be it's going to be a challenging session. We're going to go for a tub, and it might be something like the the old what we used to do, Hugh, the old Friday ten miler, <laughs> ten miler at night across somewhere with head torches on with a safety vehicle in tow and then we'll finish at the pub and have a bit of a social where we'll have a curry and a beer and have a chat about the experience and and, and go from there and that's the sort of thing that that i i want to to, to carry on and, and, and do more of and so we i'll put that out there soon and then um we'll go from there and see what other events we're gonna we're gonna lay on but there's gonna be more and more in the pipeline certainly yeah one sec As you as you relax into it, your 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 voice has got louder. I see a booming. That's no, it's fine. It's not a drama. It's the, um, I was nervous at the beginning. I know. That's no, fucking miles away. Pull it in. Pull it in slightly to you. 
<laughs> there you go. Way yeah. better now. Yeah, it's exactly. Is that right? Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Mate, it's a really interesting... That is a really interesting dynamic there that you're pulling together in that... Okay, having a bunch, having people of different abilities together, right? Training is is in itself not unusual. I mean, look at uh, look at, you know, I go to Nuffield and sometimes do classes in there, right? And you've got people of different abilities doing I don't know, a fucking body pump. Not that I've done body pump once, only because some misses made me go right. But body pump, for example, you can you know people can go in there, they can work as hard as they want to work or don't want to work, especially when you got like a class of twenty people or thirty people. Listen, watching some lady or some bloke lead the class, they can put as much or a little weight on the bars as they want, all that, right? That in itself is not unusual. But when you when you when you mix those people with different abilities in there into an environment where they seemingly doing the same things as as other very fit people, people who are fitter than them, right? Or not as fit as them. As in you give the example that like everyone looks like they're kind of the same weight, the Bergen's the same size, right? Uh and you do it over a time period like that, 45 minutes, an hour, are we talking? An hour, yeah? Yeah, hour session. When you're tabbing, or on the boot next would say flipping, yomping, right? When you're tabbing, there is an opportunity there for like little things like conversation in the gaps where you're not doing your exercises at the stops. There's an opportunity there to grow that sort of camaraderie, right? And what I like about that is when you've got people who are, very physically fit. There's like a there's like a vibe, an energy to give off. You know, you know this. You could put twenty people in a room, right? And you could have a, a, you could have ten of those people could be flipping, like, do are active. They do fitness all of the time, and the other ten people do nothing. You could probably pretty accurately just by looking at them, not even speaking to any of them, pick them out. You could probably get a, a, as near as damn it as split them, split in the room. Go, yeah, you're you person does fitness. You go, that's what I think. You go that side. You probably be right most of the time, right? So when you get those fit people, be able to interact with people who want to be fit, or maybe have a thing in their mind where they don't think they're very fit. They got that sort of like little bit of lack of self confidence, like we all do. Even like we get when you haven't done fitness for a few months or whatever, and you think I need to get back in the fucking gym. When you go back, for me anyway, when I go back to the gym or go up for a run it's always about mind oh my god i'm like I, I, it's just not there that that sort of i was gonna say elitist thinking but it's not it's not elitist think elite thinking it's just you know that that confidence in yourself isn't there so that energy and that vibe and that of those fitter people that rubs off on people who could do with that in those events so you've got an opportunity to engage with each other you like you've just hit the nail on the head that that that's exactly what I'm trying to create that vibe and that vibe is there it's there already um like I, th- I can't remember exactly what I've put on my website but it says something along the lines of to challenge people to show people that and challenge people that they're capable of more and the confidence bit is key the, the amount of people that come along and don't think that they can do it or have concerns or worries and well, then once they can do it once they once you've shown that they can do it, then that confidence comes through. And like you know, fitness isn't all about the physical element; it's the it's the mental element as well. So if you've got the confidence to go with the physical, you just you it just makes people physically and mentally stronger. And and it's just like you say, it's a good vibe. It, it brings people along, brings people together, creates that community. Essentially, like if you look, I I thought about this the other day. Um, because someone asked me, they said, Ed, because I, I mean, probably you do the same. We we spin bits of past life, times in parachute regiment. And so, and I've got great memories of the reg. And so someone said, well, Ed, you, you, you love the parachute regiment. Why did you leave? If it was that good, why did you go? And I was like, good question, isn't it? It's like, why did I leave? And um, because it was good. Um, but at the same time, it was hard. I'm not going to lie, it was hard. It, time in battalion is hard, and you haven't got a life. The, you are doctrined into that environment. And um, But what I, what I did, what I've done, I've, I've wanted to take the good bits out of it. Like, you know, it wasn't all good. A lot of bad bits. But the good bits is the culture, the ethos, the com- camaraderie, and the belonging. I think belonging is key. And in, in the civilian world, I think there's people that, don't have that or never had that so i kind of I, w- I want to for people that want it 
to show them what it's like to ha to be part of something, to to be uh, to have that trust, to have that fit. So, like the other night, I, there was ten of us and we were out tabbing around Walton Hall Hotel, pitch black. No one's going to run around Walton Hall Hotel in the pitch black. But together, you can because of safety in numbers. And everyone thought everyone finished. Well, that was mega. That was how good was that? Never done that in my life. Like you know, we've done loads of tabs at night. That's most of the tabbing we did was at night. Insurgents ex coming out um, off 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 the battlefield. But in the civilian life, who goes tabbing across a field on a bright path at night? No one does. So not many people do. So again, it's just giving people an experience of something that they haven't done. But when we're all having that same experience and it's creating that culture, that ethos, that belonging, that trust, that that vibe that you, you mentioned. Well, it comes from hardship. That's that's what that comes it, It's hardship. It's like, it, <clears throat> there is one thing other comics, you know, have a common experience together and that, that does do something on a really, like, basic level. <sighs> but it's the ones where it's hardship. You experience hardship together. That's what forms the biggest bonds. That's why you get, you know, Groups of people who were involved in a flipping some accident or ex or or saw something horrific or or were exposed to something like that or they took part in a fitness event that was really hard. I mean, look at look around you. The um, Wolf Run, Wolf Run, for example. Those it's like you know they they see another Wolf Front top. They immediately have an affinity to that. They 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 sort of connect with that person because they go, oh yeah, they did that too, and it was gopping. It's like we do when I mean, we see another a power a, a bloke with a power edge top on, or anybody with anything military. You have a, you see a connection to them and go, oh yeah, they did some hard stuff too, you know. Um, and the closer that the closer that con that thing is that you see that connects you to to or the, the more tightly knit that is, the smaller the group that the exclusivity of it makes that connection stronger. But it's the hardship thing. It's just doing something fucking tough, you know. I mean, uh, you give the example of a 18, 19 year old reg bloke and a sixty odd year old old biddy, you know, who's probably carrying about five pound in a bergen, <laughs> you know. Um, but essentially, she is viewing it as having achieved the same thing as the the young lad or lady who's on the on the course on on the on the session with her. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's hardship. It's interesting. I so I think some cracking. There's, um, there's that hardship element, um, but there's also that balance because I. This is something which I've had to kind of, in my own mind, and it's something which the one of the, one of the issues I have come across is partly because of the name of my business. It's called Warrior Strong. So a lot of people straight away are Warrior Strong, ex parachute regiment guy. This is going to be, he's going to just beast us, and. Um, and this, and that's the bit I've had to battle at. I think it's the it's trying to make people understand that no, I'm not here to beast people, absolutely not. So again, it's about challenging people, but it needs to be achievable. So that's how that's how it is. So it's it, yes, I challenge people, but I make it achievable. So everything all my sessions are achievable, it, and and I'm not there thrashing people for the sake. And I, I I don't use the word thrashing. I don't and I don't scream and shout. Um, don't need to. Um, it's uh, the motivation is is kind of created through the the group mentality. So I'm just providing the service and 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 the um, the routes and the the know how I suppose of the exercises. But um, yeah, it's it's challenge, but we but within your within your ability. Let's go off topic slightly, sort of, but not. Just popped in my mind. How did the so you were in the PT core for a long time, right? How did the attitude to fitness training, physical fitness training, there change over the time you were there? And 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 also, was there a perceived disconnect between the way the PT core felt things should be getting done and how units were actually doing it? Yeah, you gave the example there of yeah, you, know, you set targets to be achievable. A lot of the stuff we did in training and in and in battalion, a lot of the stuff was deliberately unachievable. Like fail, 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 fail. That's why I ask. Yeah, some good questions. Um, so, 
there's a big difference, I think, with if you look at like Powers, Marines, Special Forces guys, <coughs> there is a little bit, it's got to be different. I think we had to be almost broken down, didn't we, to then build us back up. And that was kind of the mentality, I, I, I think, certainly 20 odd years ago. Um, but then within the military, the, the things changed within, certainly, things are always changing, aren't they? And there's always that that thing where, oh, it wasn't as hard as it was in my day type of attitude. But in <coughs> my experience is this, um, things had to change. Because when we started, I don't know about you, but I remember we started, in, I think it was called Prack. There was about 100 of us. And we got thrashed, we got beasted. That original 100, I think there was only five of us that passed out. So look at the wastage, like 95 people never actually made it but a lot of those people were good would have been good powered, would have been good soldiers um and then you look at the uh, more recently you look at like i was i was sitting on some some of the meetings and seeing the stats and, and they were horrendous like at some at one point there was like 27 percent of the british army were medically undeployable and you look at the numbers of the, of the armed forces that, that that that's significantly that's massive and then on top of that is the cost. So every time, not all, not the whole, not all those people are um, medically undeployable because of injury. There's illness and and, and lots of other things that um, within that. But a, a big majority of that was musculoskeletal injuries. And um, I believe the um, I don't know if it's General Carter or his predecessor. He basically turned someone turned around to the PT Corps command officer and said, look, you, we need to do something about this because we're breaking too many people. And uh, so basically what, what they did, they, the PT Corps did something really good. They went, rather than just going, right, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll fix it. They went, they took it outside, they took it to Chichester University and said, look, we need you to look at this. So Chichester University came along and they did a study. They looked at what we did in the military, looked at all the different jobs we did. And uh, they were like, well, yeah, the, the problem is you're doing lots of uh, lifting, you're doing lots of um, strength type exercise or movement patterns within your day-to-day -day job across the board. Um, but you're, you're predominantly training people to be fast runners. So if you, th if you think our fitness test was a mile and a half run, so you were classed as being fit if you're skinny little whip it. So if you're skinny whip it, you're a fit, fit bloke, and if you're a big, heavy bloke, you were classed as probably not so fit because you, you were running in, what, 10, 30, 11 minutes. Uh, so they, 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 they turned it on its head. They went, right, we need to change our testing system. So they, cut a long story short, they, they got rid of, they reduced the amount of uh, tabbing, the amount of running, because they also identified, well, that running and tabbing, a lot of it was junk mileage. They call it junk mileage, where you just constantly, you just constantly pounding the ground and, y and your joints eventually are going to break. And there was no, every unit had their own, f depending on the PTI. If you had a PTI that was into football, that unit was great at football. If you had a PTI that was into volleyball, they were great at volleyball. If you had a PTI that was into running, they were great runners. Someone else that was into s strength training, they were all really good at strength training, but there was nothing, there was no uniformity of the way we trained our soldiers. So they brought in this new army physical training system. And it reduced the tabbing and running by over half, I believe. But then what they did, they they implemented loads more strength training, lots more strength training, uh, and also looked at the way that we um, did our training syllabus. So rather than going, right, day one, there you go, massive heavy pack, crack on until you break. Um, they went, right, what we'll do, we're going to strip it right back. You're going to start, we're going to progress it periodization style training, what top athletes do. Y don't get me wrong, it's not perfect, but it's 100% better than where we were. So training, we're now, we now train our soldiers a lot more scientifically in a, in a lot better way of doing business. So we build, it's, the mnemonic we use is we train the chassis and then train the engine. So we build the strength. Once we've built the strength, we can then add the engine into it. We can make people faster. And then we can look at other bits and pieces, flexibility, uh, agility, 
balance pro perception. But the key thing is that people are strong. Now, they trialed it because they thought, right, if we're going to do this, we need, we've got to get the buy-in. So the best place to get the buy-in is let's do it with power of edge guys and the infantry guys up in Catterick. So they trialed it in Catterick. In depot? In depot, yeah. Okay. Depot soldier. And they literally reduced the running, the tabbing by half or maybe a bit more. They add in loads of strength training exercises. And what was really interesting, because I, I myself, I remember being told this and I was like, nah, this this isn't going to work. <laughs> this isn't going to work. Ta- to be good t- tabbing, you've got to tab. But, um, but no, actually, th- what was really interesting was the depot power, the platoon that they trialed it on, they had something along the lines of, don't quote me on this, but it's something along the lines of 80% reduction in injury. But what was really interesting is they increased fitness, uh, so the, the, their fitness um, pass rate increased as well. So not only were they getting less injuries, more people were passing the fitness test. So they were getting stronger at tubbing by tubbing less, but carrying heavier packs. They're getting stronger, so they're starting off in the gym lifting heavy and then build it up. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's changed like, through my time of being in the, in, in the army. And um, for the better. And so what I've done, luckily enough, I w- I've saw the change and saw how good it was. And so I've taken that sort of ethos that, and that methodology, if you like, into what I do now. So when people turn up, I go, well, there you go. There's a heavy burger and crack on, follow me. No, no. We build people up. We, we, it's got to be progressive and we've got to work on strength. We've got to work on good form. And then we can add, so hence why I don't take people on on a normal session. I don't. We, we don't go for an eight-mile yomp or eight-mile tab and eight-mile run. We, we, we shorten it, but we do lots of strengthening exercises within the session. And over a period of time, you get stronger without having to do lots and lots of mileage because mileage isn't particularly great for your joints, as we probably both know as we're getting older. They wear out. So, um, yeah, that's... Uh, Hopefully that's answered your questions. So how do you make your how do you make your muscul- musculoskeletal system more resilient then in terms in that way? So because obviously tabbing what a weight carrying right is a requirement. Yeah, you, know, you just think of any operation we've been on in the in the past flipping gazillion years, a lot of weight, a lot of weight bearing, especially in the counterinsurgency counterinsurgency stuff. Um, so how do you prepare the body to get less injuries but still be able to be okay with that mileage and on the mind as well so yeah it, let, let me answer the second question first so the <laughs> psychological this is this is one area where i always thought the one thing that we're missing by not so the eight miler the eight miler for me was or the 10 miler which we did in battalion was it was never physically challenging for me i knew i could it was the it was the psychological aspect of it. It was fucking painful. Yeah. And it was just monotonous, wasn't it? It's just for two hours, you've got to put a, put a shift in. Yeah, but, it's, but, the, but the interesting... Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, you, you know what you mean when you say it's not challenging? It's not challenging in, in a cardiovascular way. No. It's not challenging even in a... Uh, what's the other one? The other way. <laughs> Your muscles get fatigued. But it's it's painful. It's pain... It, 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 yeah, it's painful. Yeah. Because your shoulders get fucking sore, your back gets sore. Yeah. Because it's one of those things with weight. It's like you can, you can, you basically you can do as much tabbing as you want. You can get as fast as you want to do in tabbing as long as, as your body is physically capable of. You know, um, tabbing was one of my strong points, but it didn't. It's almost like I wasn't any less pain as as I as I as I got quicker or I was able to carry more weight. You know, I was in no less pain. I was just used to. Bearing the pain, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean. It's yeah, a weird uh, one. Yeah, uh, well, we're talking, we're talking the hurt locker, aren't we? You go in the hurt locker, <laughs> and you know every time you go in that locker, it's the same old locker. Yeah, it, you just, you just get used to being in that hurt locker, don't you? you and you go through that pain barrier. Um, it's coat and mech. I remember I used to sorry to interrupt. I remember I used to say it to myself when it was on when we were on exercises or anything big like that, and a couple of times on uh, on tour, carrying. Re- ridiculous weight i remember going across it was salisbury playing i had in the region of 110 120 pound mcbergen um we jumped in 
and then it was like it was like a, it was eight mile. It was an M, eight mile insertion tab into a defensive exercise. Oh my god, I couldn't. You know, it's one of those you know where you you sit down for a break. You know, the whole the, the flipping battalion snake whatever stops. You sit down for a break for a couple of minutes, and you can't get up. And it takes two people to lift you up because you got that much weight on. You're that fucked. But I remember going along. And a, and and a few and this is how I would get myself through that sort of pain barrier of rationalizing myself whether to keep going or not. I in my head I do an assessment of her body and be right. My legs are fine. Like my legs, I'm walking. There's no, I've got no, no, I've got no fatigue in my legs. My legs are fine, right? I can hold my body up, right? It's just my back is killing me. Lower back's killing me. Shoulders are killing me. I used to say it myself. Legs are fine. You're okay. Legs are fine. You're okay. Keep going. Keep going. Because keep going. the pain in the back, it's not going to go away. You just got to, you just got to roll with it. But go this on. is this is the, this is why it's now. So when we did that, we we tapped, we tapped, we tapped, we tapped, we tapped. How often did you and I ever go into the gym and get shown how to deadlift? <laughs> we didn't do it, did we? So we actually didn't do any strength training upper body in our back, our core. We didn't do it. And that's why you, you and I and everyone else used to have so much back pain because we didn't have the muscles support the skeleton. So if the muscles aren't strong, it can't support the skeleton. So however aerobically fit you are, and however strong you are in your mind, the, if the, once the muscles fatigued, that's where you're going to get the injury. So just by doing tabbing, tabbing, running, running, running isn't doesn't do work strength. You've got to work strength. So, you, so what I'm saying is now in what is different now is we now build strength into the into the training so we get into the we we lift weight correctly we show people how to lift weight correctly so we we do our deadlifts we do our presses we we build strength and once you build the strength then you can the mileage you can add the mileage accordingly you still got to work on your uh, endurance but before before it was always a uh, endurance 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 and you might do a little strength session. Now it's strength, 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 and then we'll build the endurance and the engine into it. Um, but yeah, this, uh, and that and that's the key. That that's the key. It's, it's building that strength. And once you build that strength, then and also, it's about. But not only uh, so you talked about resilience, uh, physical resilience. So if you go, if you're walking on a lot of people training in a, in a gym or, or on a treadmill or on flat surfaces. And all your little proprioceptors around your joints, they're not getting used. So it's really vital to... Proprioceptors. Proprioceptors. So they're like, proprioceptors are like little muscles around the joint that hold the joint that, that are constantly firing off to stabilize that joint. And the best way to train those proprioceptors, you can do your, your, your balance exercises, but the best way to do it is go and walk on uneven ground or tab on uneven ground, run on uneven ground. So if you look at like a quick... If you look at a track athlete, a track a track athlete is like your Formula One racing car. Where you down your mountain runner, yeah, they're like that's like your defender. <laughs> so like Land Rover here. Yeah, Land Rover defender is your mountain runner. <laughs> but if you take a track 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 athlete and put them on a cross country course, you bet your bottom dollar they're gonna go over the ankle. Because they haven't been they haven't trained, they haven't conditioned themselves to run on the uneven surfaces. So again, it's really important. And it's something which I talk about in my sessions is we, we train on uneven ground. We go across uneven ground because it over a period of time it, it builds the strength and resilience in the joints, which is key, key for for reducing injury. So yeah, there's like you know, I could talk all day about fitness. There's 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 lots of components of fitness. People come to me, I don't want to get fit. Great. But that's like saying going to a, a car show, I want to buy a car. All right, great, but what what do you want it for? Do you want a sports car? Do you want a defender? Do you want a family vehicle? So when you say you want to get fit, what what actually do you mean by that? Do you just want to, you know, oh, I want to be able to play rugby. Okay, great. So we need to work on a bit of strength, a bit of speed. S- strength and speed equals power. power. So that's what we're kind of working on. But, but we, we also need to look at other bits and pieces like your agility and your coordination and your balance. But then there's someone else might, oh, I just want to get up the stairs without being out of breath. All right, cool. So we, we just work on some a bit of strength training for some stability as you're going up the stairs, but we we'll also work on some cardiovascular type training. So it all depends on what you want. You're only as fit as what you train for at the end of the day. Um, th- like fitness is a fashion thing now, isn't in, in civilian in the civilian world. There's and there's so much choice. You can go and do your box size. You got your um, Tabata sessions, your spin classes, your um, CrossFit, um, and it's all good stuff. You just got to decide what what's good for you, 
Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit here now and go, oh yeah, what you want to do is watch on fitness all day long. That's the, that's the way forward. No, I, I, I say it's like a mix it up. If you do CrossFit, great. But I wouldn't just do CrossFit every day of the week. You, you're going to probably overtrain and get injured. So how dare you mix how it up? How dare you say that about CrossFit? Mix it up. That, that's <laughs> what I say. Every, it's like everything in life, isn't it? Everything in balance. Yeah, e- everything in moderation. In moderation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So get the moderation. And it isn't just about your, your training. It's your food, your sleep, your mental health. It all. It's like a. I call it the fitness triangle. So you can, like the fire triangle, right? So fire. I'm going to test you now. What do you need for fire? <laughs> fire, air, and uh, oxygen. Fi- uh, fire, air, and um, fire, oxygen, and fuel. And fuel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> heat is what you're looking for. Fi- heat, 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 oxygen, oxygen and, fuel. and fuel. So the fitness triangle it works in in a similar way. So you have good training good nutrition, and good sleep and recovery. So, back to the military, was nutrition looked at when you were looking at this revising, not revising, yeah, revising what, uh, reviewing what was needed to change in the physical side? Oh, look at the face he put in. Oh. I could probably get myself in trouble. Um, You're out now. <laughs> so Don't get I, yourself in trouble. So I can, I, can I say what I want now? Um, the thing is, uh, the, my opinion on n- the nutrition Nutrition's key, which we know. Uh, the problem is, in my opinion, it we're let down by the military and the, with the contractors, um, uh, and uh, and that's the bottom line. The contractors are there to, well, they win the contract, so that they, they 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 tell they, they say what they want what they want the army to hear yeah we'll produce all this good stuff and they create all these good boards and powerpoint presentations and it all looks great it all look, looks mega but then what you actually end up with on the hot plate is not exactly what we've probably been led to believe we're going to get and um again like my last unit i worked at the uh, defense medical services and um i was constantly beating the drum about the nutrition and it's about they've got them like for example, here's one thing. So they've got an, an, an monopoly on, they've got the little shop. And you go in the little shop and it's just, f- all the offers are chocolate, crisps, Monster Munch, Coke. I remember going there one day, I was like, where's the water? Oh, if you look right down there at the bottom right, there's, why's the water down there? Why all can I see in front of me is, is cans of Monster? And uh, essentially what it is, is the Monster's owned by Coke, Coke own the fridges. So Coke say to the the contractor, right, you can have these fridges for free, but we want all our products at, at eye level because that's what sells. Because they employ psychologists, they know if it's at eye level, it sells. So they put all the monster drink, the Coke, at eye level, and the water is hidden away. And that's what you're battling against. You're battling against commercial world. That's one side of it, though. So one side is what's been provided. Yeah. And the other side is what's wanted. So... You know, my I know my understanding of nutrition, for anything, in fact, anything to do with health, no serving, anything to do with health, physical, mental, dietary health, was very, very poor, um, very poor, and now it's a little bit different. So, um, is there a part of it? Is there a part of that 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 sort of new system that is nutrition orientated, educating people to eat better? Probably not, actually. I the, think. Well, you've, you've, you, I, th- I think people know what they should be eating. If I'm honest, uh, to a certain degree, I th- like the education is there. The, the, there are um, presentations on healthy in nutrition. There's posters left, right, and centre of this is what you should be eating. This is what you shouldn't be eating. We shouldn't eat as much as this, and we should eat more of that. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is, when you go into the cookhouse and you have got curly fries and chips for 99p and if you want a jacket potato you're gonna have to wait 20 minutes and oh by the way that isn't included in the meal deal you've got to pay a bit extra for that then it it's one of my bugbears let's be honest it's something which i was never happy with um and i think we could do a lot better that um yeah yeah i think the problem with that the problem with when we talk about diet and nutrition everyone has a lot of people have their own opinion on what you should have um, and trying to sell that and people for for right and wrong reasons, you know, um, 
from the, the, the different types of like a high level different types of diet at a high level from plant based to flipping you know normal diet rounded diet to bloody fruit based some people aren't they some people are, some people are entirely meat based aren't they um whereas i think the the you could we could get a better reaction or better response from like people who don't eat that healthily and i am like my missus will tell you i will preach about i don't preach about it but i like you know I, I i believe a lot in the right nutrition i know i know what i think you should how you should be acting and eating and all of that i don't follow it to the letter of the law myself right but if you were to pull it back and instead of saying to people this is what you should be eating you say these like this is what you shouldn't be eating like this and and for me there's one thing there's one thing that you could just go stay away from this there's no argument with it sugar if you just started with that and go stay the fuck away from sugar people don't go anywhere near sugar it's literally horrendous it is horrendous because it is it's, I, don't, I don't know if people realise like if, that, if I could get everyone to do one thing it'd be like sugar no sugar make it make it illegal and alcohol as well and I love alcohol <laughs> but sugar and alcohol should go to hell yeah anyway that's it <laughs> But you see my point. If it's, you will it down through, this is there's but, no argument here. But, Stay away from this. But, Everything else, do what you want. But Stay I, from this. That's one thing I'm going to disagree on. <laughs> because, on. But, but the, here's the thing. Um, so, true story. So we went out for a family meal. Now my cousin, hopefully she doesn't listen to this. Right, she's a nutritionist. <laughs> I think it's Tiger. What's her name? <laughs> so she's a nutritionist. However. She's probably the most unhealthy person I've I've ever seen on this planet. She doesn't look healthy. Jesus Christ. And you know me, Hugh, I just say it how it is, right? <laughs> so we're in this family meal, and I'm like, look, I'm in calorie deficit, because I've done my training for the day. So I've, I've, I've done, I'm in calorie deficit. I'm like, and I like steak. I'm not going to lie, and I like chips. Explain to people and what you're talking about, calorie deficit, for people who don't know. So what I'm talking about is um, <coughs> people train to burn calories, um, because they want to lose weight, um, but what I'm saying is, I, I'm like I'm I know. Well, I th I'm thinking I'm going to go out for a nice meal today. So in order for me not to feel guilty eating that steak and and, and those chips, I'm going to go and train first. So I've already burnt those calories, which I'm going to eat later on. That's what I mean by calorie deficit. Earning your scoff. Earning, Earning your scoff. scoff. Yeah, any scoff. So rather than the other way around. Um, so anyway, I'm having this meal. And uh, I can sort of sense her looking at me as if, like, I can't believe you're eating that. How bad. Blah, blah, blah. And then to top it all off, I, the, the dessert menu came around and I went for a chocolate fudge brownie with cream and, and, and whatever else. I don't and, um, and I was like, you're going to tell me how many calories are in this now, aren't you, Joe? And she was like, well, I, I, considering you're into your fitness, I'm surprised that you're eating all that. I'm like, the thing is, Yes, university, nutritional, nutritional degree will say that that is bad for you. And I can't argue with that. But what it doesn't show you is how, how good it made me feel. <laughs> so psychologically, mentally, it was good for me. So this is the thing. I'm like, I talked about it earlier, everything in moderation, in balance. So if I cut sugar out my diet, I'd probably get depression. Because it, those little things, like... Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, I don't eat chocolate fudge cake every day, but as a treat, it, it's mega. It is mega. And so, it's like my red wine. I don't drink a bottle of red wine every night, but when I have a glass of red wine, it's brilliant. And so, I'm not a dietitian, I'm not a nutritionist, but what, what I am is a realist, and I, I like to think I'm a realist, and I think, look, I, and I don't train, like, to excess. I don't, I try not to do anything to excess. So I think that's the key. In my opinion, that's the key. That, I just think if you eat a varied diet in moderation, you won't go far wrong as long as you also train in moderation. So if I if all I did was tab every single day for miles and miles, and miles I'm going to injure myself. I don't do that every day. Um, you've got to be varied. varied. Like if you look at top athletes, Top, top athletes, long distance winners. By the time they're 60, they all have knee replacements. Cyclists. Everyone says, oh, go cycling, go swimming. It's really good. It's no weight bearing. But actually what they've discovered now that a lot of cyclists and a lot of swimmers, they don't do anything else. They don't do any 
and the um, pounding type exercises, they're getting osteoporosis. I didn't know this. Yeah. When did this, when did this stuff come Oh, it's come out there. Have a look at it. Google it. What's osteoporosis? It's basically where the brains, uh, the brains, the, the bones start breaking down because the, the bones need impact. For density. To, to, for density. Mm. Um, it's the same problem. Osteoporosis is what astronauts suffer from as well, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah so yeah. it's the same. And so they've done studies now and go, actually, if you do too much of that, it's like you do too much of anything, it's not great for you. So look at Andy Murray. Yeah, he played tennis for a young age, all play, and now he's, he's had to have a hip replacement. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. So if you just, if you concentrate on what, I think I've looked back, and I know I'm only 42, so I'm relatively still young. Uh, in my head, I'm still like 20. Um, and I've, I've been quite lucky. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still in fairly good shape. Con considering what I've done, why am I still in good shape? Is it luck? Is it genetics? Is it this? Is it that? It could be a combination. I think it is probably a combination. But the key for me, I think, is because I get bored easily. And this is, you go, well, what's he on about now? Mixing it up, you're talking it's about. It's about mixing yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah. So I will do something for a while and then get bored. So I love climbing. I don't climb. I'm not. For, I don't. I'm not fanatical about it. I won't climb constantly all the time because if you do, a lot of climbers now, uh, if all they do is climb, they end up with um, problems with their fingers, the, the ligaments in their fingers and their joints. Um, I like. I like mountain biking, um, but I don't do it all the time. I like running, but I don't. Do, I say I like running. I don't. To be honest, everyone's like, "Oh yeah, you like running because you're good at running." I'm like, I don't actually. I, you know, honestly, I don't like running. Why do you run? And I was like, why do I even? Oh, because I like beating people. <laughs> 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 I like racing people. Uh, but I don't actually enjoy winning. But the th what I'm trying to get at is I I do lots of different disciplines and it's kind of kept me, it, it's kept my body balanced. So I haven't over, I haven't overused something, I think. Th and, that, and that's only, that isn't fact. That's just opinion and, and, and thought process of, I know peers, friends of mine that uh, in fact have hip replacements or knee replacements at the same age as me. And then I look at what they've done and they're like, all they've done is one discipline or one or two disciplines. And so it's a massive overuse. They're, they're, they're doing hundreds of miles in their, pre, in their 20s, 30s. The, the pounding, the concrete, the tarmac, hundreds and hundreds of miles. Yes, top level runners. Um, but at some point, you've got to, at some point, something's going to give. And so, you, and again, it, it's all about what you want, isn't it? So if you want to be a top-level athlete, be a top-level athlete, but just bear in mind that something's going to give as you go into older age. Someone said to me the other day, I went, Ed, so what are you training for now? And I was like, well, kind of, I'm kind of not. And they're like, what do you mean you're not? And I, I had to think, because I, sometimes I just do stuff without thinking, and I'm like, yeah, what am I training for? And I, I and I haven't got like everyone says you should have a goal, and um, yeah, I think maybe you should have a goal, but I haven't got like I feel like I haven't got anything to prove, so I don't need to go and do I don't know a desert marathon, or I don't have to go and do wolf run. I, I feel like I've I've kind of done it in my mind. I've done it. From, I'm, I'm happy. Um, so why? So why keep training? Why keep working hard on my fitness and trying to get a healthy lifestyle? And I, I think what it is, is I want to, if I'm still alive, and there's no guarantees, are there? But if I'm still alive at 80, I still want to go skiing with my kids. And, and that is my goal. That is my long-term goal. So it isn't about, like the last five years of being in the army, I had fitness tests, but nobody was telling me to do them because I was in charge, I was the PTI. I still did them. Why was I doing it? Um, I suppose it was just that sort of professionalism, sort of, I, I want to show that I can still do it. But then internally, it was kind of, I want to keep myself as fit as I can for as long as I can. And I think that's it. I, I, w I want to still be able to go skiing when I'm in my 80s. Yeah. I went, I went through a period of, when I left, of, like you said, what are you training for? So I didn't, it was the motivation to, it was the motivation to train. Like, um, and so I was trying to pick something to 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 do as a as a fitness thing, that that I could that there was levels to succeed in it. So 
jujitsu. I tried, yeah, I say I tried it, I did do it. And then my lifestyle became that I wasn't able to go to the same gym anymore all the time or re- even regularly at all. And so I was like, why the fuck, what am I going to do? And I, and I couldn't get motivation to do anything. And then, and so the reason I do, I, I keep fit now, well, two reasons. One is similar to what you just said. I, I want to be mobile when I'm older. And two is mental health. Because I've, I know that if I, t- in fact, someone posted it on, 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 uh, online uh, earlier this morning and said, and said basically said, give an example of w- why she does what she does, and she said, and one of the things she said was, if she doesn't do, if, for, if she doesn't do any fitness for a few days, her confidence goes down and her anxiety goes up, and I experience exactly the same thing, and as time goes on, it gets worse to the point where my confidence is really impacted, which impacts everything I do, and the anxiety is really impacted. And so that's the other reason, the mental health side. But on the, on that sort of wanting to be mobile and I'm older, well, there's one, one piece of uh, information that I was, I, I don't know, I can't remember how I came across it. It was a few years ago and it really stuck in my mind. And it was to do, it was the stats of basically people when they get older, uh, it was to do with the percentage of people who die within six months of being admitted into a care home, right? Which is something in the region of 60%. This is, I'm not on about pandemic here, folks, by the way. I'm on about just in general, right? Sixty percent or seventy percent of of old people who get admitted into a care home, that's the percentage of people who die within six months of going in there. End of life. Goodbye, you're done. And the majority of reasons people get admitted into care homes is because they, are, they become unable to care for themselves. And what and what is meant by that is in in the practical terms is if they, this is like this is often like the the, the game changer for when the family has to make a decision or what do we do with old grand granddad fucking granddad Hugh, oh well he fell over again, and um we can't and he couldn't get himself back up and found him uh found him flipping, tw- you know twelve hours after he fell over, well you've got no choice then unless you're in a, a position where you can dedicate a lot of time or you can afford to have a private carer for example to come and look after that person most people don't have that. So Grandad Hugh is going to a care home because he can't look after himself. He can't pick himself up. And do you know what? Do you know this is one of the reasons I fucking walk all the time now as well. Another reason, just because I walk one just to get out and about to clear my head, and two because I want to keep them like walking, and I run as well. One of the key reasons Grandad Hugh can't pick himself up off the floor and keeps falling over is because he can't catch himself when he trips. It's you know as as basic as it is because. Because Grandad Hughes, fast, fast sort of twitch muscles and his ligaments and that in his in his hips and his legs, when he trips, he knows he's tripped. He can't get his leg out in front quick enough to catch himself. Grandad Hughes falling over again, and Grandad Hughes in the care home, and Grandad Hughes got about six months to go, because he didn't keep walking, he didn't keep up doing fitness, he didn't keep himself healthy, he didn't go out when he was forty. He didn't take that decision to go. I'm going to be more. I'm going to be more active. I never go out anymore. I'm going to go out for a walk. When he was Fucking 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old. And now, granddad who's in the care home is going to die. Exactly. There's a lesson, kids. Woo! That is. <laughs> and I haven't got time to come and visit you in your care home. <laughs> <laughs> so keep walking. Jen up, mate. That is Jen up. That, when, no, I heard, when I heard that stat, yeah. it's like, uh, who the fuck broke it down? There's they broke s- it right down from people going in and then it's tripping over. Go on. There's, a, there's another couple of different, st- similar stats. Um, off the top of my head, uh, again, don't quote me on the actual numbers. But I'm going to quote you. I'm going to quote you. Exactly. Never quote me. Um, <laughs> never quote me, and I, and I never make promises. But <laughs> the because uh, this is one of the things. As a PTI, I used to get people come up to me and go, "Well, it doesn't mean you're going to live longer." I'm like, I think it does. Well, <laughs> you mean you might be right. You might be right. But this is the thing. What they, there was a I read this. You know, I said I don't read much, but I did read this paper. It was in America, but what they worked out was that people they did a study and they went right: people that train regularly, people that don't train regularly. And they looked at the um, the age that they died, on average, um, and it wasn't much different. And it was a bit like, oh, why? I thought because I was like, oh, people that train, they're going to live longer. Actually, there wasn't much difference. There wasn't much difference. But here's the thing. Where the difference was, was the people that train, on average, they only needed medical attention 
within the last 18 months of their life. The people that didn't train needed medical attention for the last 20 years of their life. So then you look at it and go, right, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. So it's, again, it's just like, what do you want? And, and I know for me, I'm like, as you said there, I, I want the quality of life. I want to be able to keep mobile, not be put in that care home, or not have to have somebody having to wipe my ass for me for the last X amount of years. And, 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 that, and, and the other one is, um, as we, we know, as you, as you get older, by the time you've, I think it's, it's, I might be wrong, I think it's when over the age of 30, you might have been a bit younger, you, you, you lose more muscle than, than you, if you did nothing, you're losing more, or you, more um, cells are dying than you're actually creating. Um, and so by the time you're 75, they reckon you've lost, the average person has lost about 25% of their muscle mass by the time you're 75. If you don't do anything, or just generally? Uh, uh, everyone. Okay. But obviously, the, if you can carry on doing strength training well into your, into your 70s, okay, you're not going to be bench pressing what you were when you're, in your, when, you're, when you're 20. But if you keep doing strength training, then you've got more muscle you can afford to lose. And denser bones. And less denser likely bones. to break, healthier heart. Yeah. So it's, it's everything, isn't it? So, yeah. Like... Obviously, I'm sold on... I was a PTI for a long period of time, hence why... Um, I kind of... I accidentally fell into the PTI role. You know that, don't you? It wasn't... I didn't join the army because I want to be a PTI. I joined the army because I wanted to be a paratrooper. And then it was only... What was it? It was foot and mouth, I think, that steered me into the uh, oh, yeah. PTI world because I was supposed to go on the Pathfinder course. And that got cancelled because of foot and mouth. And I got offered the PTI course. So it's purely down to foot and mouth where I became a PTI. Look where you are now. Right, there you go. We need to we need to um we need to wrap it up. Um hey, enjoyed that chat. Really enjoyed it. How do people get hold of Warrior Strong Fitness? So you can um you can get hold of me through I've got a website, www.warriorstrongfitness.co.uk. Uh, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and uh, I am on LinkedIn, although uh, I need to get on that a little bit more. But um Do what works, mate. Do what works. Do what works, yeah. Do what works. Mega. So email me, phone me, come along to a session. Everyone's welcome. Mega. But uh, can I just say, thanks for inviting me today, Hugh. All right. My pleasure. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed the chat, mate. Really enjoyed the chat. I, I love talking about health and f fitness and diet and um, and all of it because uh, you, you can never know enough. You can never know enough. And also, importantly, it helps me form my opinions because which is ever changing. You know, the more knowledge you're exposed to, the more opinions you can form. And and if and especially on the, the around the mental health, the physical health, the nutrition bit. If I feel like I'm well informed, generally, then I feel like whatever my opinion is at that point, at least it's not crap. I'm not basing it on a Daily Mail article. Do you know what I mean? Or some flipping tree hugger at the end of the road. You know, calling me an animal killer or whatever. But random. <laughs> <laughs> going with that one mate, uh, mate. Rory is strong fitness perfect mate been a pleasure yeah absolutely cool that's it thank you for watching the H Hour podcast if you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so please subscribe here around about there I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear if not if it's not already appeared uh, you can also um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to... Uh, exclusive interviews which i do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of h hour have chosen and each guest this one included gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded it's like a pre-podcast interview lasts about 10 minutes and those interviews are really insightful really enjoyable nice and short and they only release the patrons they never, they never get released to the public i don't know why i had a little stutter there um you also get access to 
a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away give away gifts to my patron supporters, and it's all like well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events, so you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash. HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.